Welcome to Thoracic Trauma Lecture Number One. So it's going to be a quick overview. We're going to discuss major signs and symptoms in these lectures, and there'll be a series of lectures, so a total four of them. We'll discuss pathophysiology and the management of various chest injuries. We'll discuss cardiac involvement with blunt injury, so how the heart is involved in chest injuries and what happens to the heart during chest injuries. And then we'll go over some of the other thoracic injuries that you may find. All right. So thoracic injury or chest injury is very common, but it's potentially a reversible cause of death. So as paramedics, there's quite a lot that we can do about a thoracic injury. Right. Moving on to chest anatomy. So you'll see two pictures over there, and we'll discuss the one, the picture on the right in, in a moment. On the left, you'll see the sort of basic structures of the chest. And it's a good idea to go in your own time, just familiarize yourself with those basic structures and just learn to identify all those bits and pieces. They become important as we as we move on into the sort of uh, the more important injuries and so on. The little diagram on your right as you're facing the screen is pretty important as well. And I'd like to just point out a couple of things. That's a rib over there, and directly underneath the rib, we have this little bundle of vessels and nerves. Yeah. So we've got a vein over there, we have an artery, and then we have a little bundle of nerves. And a little bit later on, when we discuss uh, the treatment of some of our chest injuries, uh, that little bundle directly underneath the rib becomes pretty important. Right. The other thing I need you to understand is exactly how, uh, how the chest works, or the mechanics of breathing and that's really important. So if you have a look at the diagram, you can see where the diaphragm is. And when we breathe, that diaphragm flattens out and our intercostal muscles will then contract and it will allow our rib cage to move outwards with the diaphragm contracting downwards. This will cause an area of low pressure inside our chest cavity. And we know from physics that air will move from an uh, area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. In this case, the area of high pressure is the outside and Inside our chest cavity is the area of low pressure. So air is obviously going to move to that area of low pressure. All right. And it's going to move through this big old gaping hole in our face or our mouths and our nose. And oxygenation will take place. The diaphragm will then relax, become con convex again. The intercostal muscles will relax and allow the chest uh, to fall down. And this will create an area of high pressure inside the chest cavity. And again, as we know from physics, air moves from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. The low pressure is now on the outside, and hence the air is forced out of our chest once it's been, um, once our lungs have had an opportunity to oxygenate uh, uh, for diffusion to take place, so for our blood to get oxygenated. All right, and that's very important to understand as we go forward and uh, we talk about chest injuries. Fantastic. So there's going to be two types of um, Injuries that you're going to find are two mechanisms of injuries. So the first is blunt, and this can result as a this can be the result of direct compression. So if you're involved in a motor vehicle collision, for example, and you uh, your patient hits the steering wheel with their chest, that's going to cause some con some compression, and this may may end up fracturing ribs, fracturing the uh, parts of the chest wall, um, like the um, like the sternum. Um, it could also um, cause damage to solid organs inside the chest cavity, and you may get blood of hollow organs. So particularly inside the chest cavity, we know that we have a couple of hollow organs. So both our lungs are hollow organs, and um, to a degree our heart is also a hollow organ because it contains chambers. And that uh, so blood injury can cause blood of those organs. Next, we have deceleration forces, and deceleration forces are just when you come to a rapid stop, um, when you come to a rapid stop, your body may stop moving, but all the contents that are inside your body will continue to move. So your lungs, your heart, all the vessels inside will continue to move. And this may cause shearing of those organs and shearing of those blood vessels. A pretty simple sort of, a pretty simple idea to, to get your head around. And then obviously penetrating trauma. So that's when something goes through the actual chest cavity. And we're going to get this with edged weapons and possibly gunshot wounds. And there are other examples that I could cite uh, where we're going to get infiltration of foreign objects into the actual chest cavity. And that's really what penetration of the chest cavity means. When any of these happen, or when we get uh, any chest injuries, um, it's obviously going to res uh, um, result in tissue hypoxia. So tissue hypoxia is just inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues throughout the body. 
we may get hypervolemia. Right? So due to bleeding or due to um, compression on, on the on the sort of major organs of the cardiovascular system, we could get hypovolemia. We'll get a ventilation perfusion mismatch, and it sounds like a lot, but it's a really simple idea to understand. As you breathe air in, you may have damaged, you may have parts of your lungs that are damaged. So air goes to those parts of the of the of the lungs, but they're not very efficient in delivering oxygen um, to the blood. Uh, for oxygenation purposes, so the blood returns to the heart not properly oxygenated or not oxygenated at all, and then you get uh, poor perfusion in the tissues. So there's a mismatch. You're breathing in and out as per normal, but um, you're not oxygenating the blood, and as a result, uh, there's poor perfusion in the rest of the body. So we call that a ventilation perfusion mismatch. You may get pleural space infiltration. So the pleural space is a space between your chest wall and your lungs. Basically keeps your lungs inflated. It's a negative space. So there's two pleura, a visceral and a parietal pleura. So that visceral parietal pleura sits against the chest wall. And as you breathe in and out, there's a negative space there. And the lung actually moves with the chest wall as you breathe in and out. What may happen is you may get a hole inside the chest and there will be infiltration into that pleural space and that pleural space infiltration can cause some serious damage. Right? And we'll discuss that a little bit later as we talk about some of the some of the chest injuries. Right? You may get pump failure, and that's pretty much what we discussed when we spoke about hypervolemia. That's just when the pump or the heart starts to fail as a result of compression inside the chest, as a result of those chest injuries. We'll discuss those a little bit later when we go into more detail about the various types of chest injuries. So these are some of the signs and symptoms that you may find with chest injuries. Pretty important to just understand what each term means. And I don't want you to start thinking about contextualizing this at the moment. We'll contextualize it when we discuss each individual type of chest injury. So shortness of breath, self-explanatory, patients are going to be battling to breathe. Chest pain, self-explanatory, you've got damage to the chest. This is a trauma module after all, so... Damage to the chest is going to cause some pain. Hemoptysis, that's a fancy way of saying coughing up blood. Distended neck veins. When we talk about distended neck veins, we're talking primarily about the jugular veins, so the big old veins on the side of the, on the side of the neck over there. There may be some pathologies that will cause them to distend or uh, conversely to flatten out. Right. We'll get tracheal deviation, and this is something you won't really see in the pre-hospital environment, but it's important that you understand what it is, and it's just a deviation of it of the trachea to either the left or to the right. It's very hard to um, find tracheal deviation without the help of x-rays. Uh, so we're not really going to worry too much about that. Um, you need to know what it is, though. Asymmetrical movement. So that's when the chest is moving asymmetrical. So you might find the left side of the chest inflates better than the right side or vice versa. Or you may get paradoxical movement of the chest where the one side inflates while the other relaxes and so on and so forth. Chest wall contusion, that's just a bruise on the wall of the chest. Open wounds, self-explanatory. Subcutaneous emphysema, uh, this is a result of um, sometimes a bronchial tree injury or a tracheal injury where we've got infiltration of air underneath the skin, causes subcutaneous emphysema. It's pretty easy to identify, it's pretty easy to see. It looks like bubble wrap under the skin, and when you put your hands over it and you feel it, you'll feel a bubble wrap sort of effect underneath the skin. And this can be over the entire chest area, up into the neck, and sometimes even as far as going into the face. Right? Shock, so you should all have a pretty good idea of what shock is. Tenderness, instability, and crepitation. We all know what that is. We all know that tenderness is pain to the touch. Instability is when you actually put pressure on, a, on an area. There's instability or you feel movement in that area. And then crepitation is when we have fractured bones rubbing against one another, giving us crepitation. And then abnormal breath sounds. So we may find some abnormal breath sounds with chest injuries for obvious reasons. We'll discuss those as we uh, go forward with the rest of these lectures.